Welcome everyone to our event today, a conversation with Sonita Alizada, the Afghan rapper and artist, and Kara Krikshank, the artist, writer, and filmmaker. This is the third event in the Afghanistan series hosted by the Global Islamic Studies Center at the University of Michigan. My name is Aliyah Khan, and I'm Associate Professor of English and Afro-American Studies at the University of Michigan. I'm also the Director of the Global Islamic Studies Center at the International Institute. First, a little about us and our events this year. The Global Islamic Studies Center aims to promote the understanding of global Islamic culture and Muslim societies worldwide, not just the Middle East, but Asia, Africa, and the Americas. If you're an undergraduate student, declare our Islamic studies minor. The minor itself has no prerequisites and is 16 credits. You can find out more information on our minor page on our website, but please also reach out and contact us so we can make sure you have everything you need to declare. If you're interested in graduate programs, check out our Masters in International and Regional Studies with an Islamic Studies specialization. The application deadline is usually mid-December, and you can also find more info on our website. This master's program is 36 credits total and is usually pursued over two years. If you're a student, faculty, staff, or a community member who's interested in our events, please join our newsletter. We send out monthly newsletters and you can subscribe at the link noted here. This semester, we have four major events planned, including today's event. On February 18th, we'll be hosting Muslim Women in the Digital Age with podcaster Misha Youssef, illustrator Emin Ahmed, and the Muslim hip hop duo Ain't Afraid. They'll talk about their experiences as young Muslim women creatives and digital natives. In March, we'll be hosting a book launch and roundtable on the growing field of Islamic chaplaincy in North America. In April, we'll be holding a multi-part film and speaker series on Black Islam in the Americas. So please stay tuned to our website and our newsletter for specific dates and speakers. Today's event is the, and here's our, here's our poster for Muslim women in the digital age. Today's event is the culmination of our Afghanistan series which we began with last semester's speakers, Professor Ahmed Kais Munhasim, an Afghan scholar and activist, and later with journalist Anand Gopal. This talk is brought to you by the Global Islamic Studies Center at the University of Michigan as an event in our three-part Afghanistan series. The event is co-sponsored by the Departments of Middle East Studies, Communication and Media, Women and Gender Studies, the Arab and Muslim American Studies Program in American Culture, the Department of American Culture, and the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies, the Center for South Asian Studies, the Digital Islamic Studies Curriculum, and the Institute for Research on Women and Gender, as well as the film series, Women Make Movies. We are also advocating for support for Sunita's family, as you will hear and their resettlement from Afghanistan, as they have been targeted for her public activism on behalf of Afghan women and girls. Here is their GoFundMe link, and we will also drop it in the chat. I'd now like to introduce and welcome our speakers today. After each of them speaks, you'll have an opportunity to use the Q&A button, which you'll see at the bottom of your screens to ask questions, to type out your questions, and, we, and I will ask them for you. Sonita Alizada is an Afghan rapper and activist who has been vocal against forced marriages. Alizada first gained international attention when she released Brides for Sale, a music video in which she raps about Afghan daughters being sold into marriage by their families. She is the star of the two-time Sundance award-winning 2015 documentary film, Sonita, directed by the Iranian filmmaker, Ruxara Game Magani which details Alizada's life as a young Afghan refugee woman in Iran and her liberatory practice of music. In preparation for today's event, we have made the documentary film Sonita freely accessible to the University of Michigan community, um, as we have done that since November of last year. I hope you had a chance to see the film. 
So Nita will be talking to us today about the work, the activist work that she's doing now. Our second speaker is Kara Krikshank, who is an artist, writer, and filmmaker whose work is centered on social ecology with an emphasis on diversity and inclusion. She is curator and host of artistic cultural salons and social justice panels through her production company, Café de la Culture. She is also a writer, director, and producer of poetic theater and independent film. Kara's work has been received by audiences and institutions in France, Turkey, Brazil, and throughout the United States. She has worked as a Broadway actor and singer, youth arts mentor, educational designer, and residency teaching artists. A core theme of her work is the convergence of women's stories, multimedia arts, and rewilding. So I'd like to thank our speakers for being here today. And Sonita, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. So happy to be with you all. And for those of you who know me, good. But for some of you who are new and don't know a lot about my story, my past, I'm just going to give you a brief um, uh, summary of my past and how I got to the US and how I started my activism. Um, I was born in Herat in 1996 under the Taliban regime. And because of war, because of poverty, my family was forced to leave Afghanistan. So we went to Iran, the only place that we heard was uh, good and safe for uh, Afghan refugees. Living in Iran was not easy. First of all, we had to change our identity. Uh, and I was never allowed to go to school, but I was lucky enough to find a mosque there where one of the Afghan uh, Iranian ladies uh, taught me and many other Afghan refugees how to read and write. And after a while living in Tehran at the capital city of Iran, um, I found an NGO that provided basic education to young undocumented refugees like me. And that, uh, that is when, when uh, I learned about music, about how to read more and how to write. And even though in my family, it was against um, our tradition, against our religion to study or to uh, play music, but I was doing all of this secretly until one day my mom uh, decided to come to Iran and she thought that it was time for me to be uh, married like um, two of my other sisters that marry at very young age. But for me, it was different because I had dreams at the end. I learned about myself. I learned how uh, to play music, something that I had a very uh, interest uh, in writing music, telling stories through music. And there was so much that I wanted to share and I could not find any way better than using music. And one day I was at the gym cleaning uh, the gym where I was learning how to do karate. And instead I would clean the gym for them. I heard Eminem rapping and obviously I could understand what he was saying, uh, but I could feel the anger in his voice. And then I decided to use, as a, use the rap as a tool to share my experience, to talk about child marriage, to talk about child labor, which was happening to my friends and also me. So escaping child marriage the first time at age 10, it happened again at age 16, um, but uh, I had a team of people with me from the NGOs. And at the time when I was 16, um, a good friend of mine, Rukhsar Ghaimagami, the director of the movie, Sonita, she was uh, supporting me and she believed in me and my vision. Uh, so she talked to my mom, she bought me some time to uh, finish my studying and most importantly, record the song that I was planning to do, which called uh, Daughter Soul Cell that some of you have seen. And through that, uh, that rap song, I got full scholarship to come to the US. 
in 2015. Uh, when I came to the US, obviously it was very hard for me uh, to talk in English, still is, uh, but I found different ways to teach myself and learn faster because I wanted to share my story uh, about child marriage and child labor with the world. And especially when I learned child marriage happening even here in the US. So I thought I had to share my story. I had to be on the stage with people who cared about issues like child marriage. Uh, since then, I've been active in uh, sharing my story, which is not something fun for me, but I really want to do it because when I share my story, it gives people uh, the real face of child marriage, how it is, how people feel and what it does to girls when they're not being given the opportunity to study versus when uh, they're given the opportunity to study. Um, living in the US, it was uh, hard uh, for a long time because of my family. They did not approve of me being here on my own, but through music, I was able not only to change my family's opinion about me, about the power of girls, but I was also able to help my friends' families to see the potential for girls. And some of you who have already seen the documentary, uh, in the documentary, you see one of my uh, friends uh, who's engaged but the man, 35 years old, and she was, at that time, she was uh, 15 or 16 years old. When I escaped child marriage, when I started to write more about uh, the power of girls, they got the power, they found their own voices, and they learned more about their rights. So they decided to speak up, and uh, two of them already escaped child marriage, and they're in uh, colleges in different parts of the world. One of them is still in Iran. So these are the uh, results of my work. Maybe they're not huge, but I think I've made uh, small changes that is leading to save more lives, especially in Afghanistan today. What I'm doing right now is, uh, which is something that is really important today, is raising awareness about what's happening in Afghanistan. Uh, for two decades, different NGOs uh, in, uh, invested money, time, energy in building uh, a safer place for women in Afghanistan uh, to find their own powers, to remind them of what they can do. Uh, uh, and suddenly, by the arrival of the Taliban and because of the political um, unrest, suddenly all their achievements are undone. And today what they really need the most is to share their voices, to talk about their rights, to talk about what they had and who they took all those rights from them. And one thing that most, uh, most of the women in Afghanistan are angry at and they're upset with is the fact that people don't pay attention to them and they don't really realize what is happening in Afghanistan right now. It's not something that happened yesterday, that happened two months or three months ago. It's still continuing and it's getting worse and worse. And uh, all my energy today, all my time is invested in sharing those uh, messages, those voices. And I have a project that's called Arazu, and through Arazu, uh, we try to bring more people together, young people, especially those uh, women that are in a safer place, uh, that have the capability, that have the stage to speak up for those who are oppressed. And Arazu, which means wish, uh, basically supports two kids every month. And I'm gonna share a uh, short presentation with you to talk about the project a little more. So Arazu basically supports two kids um, every month by uh, asking people to donate uh, 300 for two Afghan kids and we uh, provide them with uh, food supplies, school supplies, clothing, and recently we added another section to RSU, which is uh, 
advocacy for Afghan women. And we have included women in this because they are the children and the women are becoming the uh, main victims of, of this political unrest. And one of the recent uh, projects supports that we provided uh, to Afghan children is Basmina. Uh, Basmina is 10 years old uh, from Kabul. Uh, she was shot and she lost her uh, um, vision, right eye. And because of uh, lack of poverty, uh, lack of financial support and because of um, non-existence, uh, NGOs in Afghanistan to support children. Uh, she was not able to be treated in hospitals and we were able to um, do some fundraising and then send her to Pakistan, which today uh, with the help of other NGOs, she was sent to Pakistan with a team of um, very professional doctors. She's doing uh, so much better. She's, uh, she's able to see again. Uh, and the other project that we raise money for is food packages. At the college where I go to, um, Bard College, with the students from Bard College, we were able to uh, collect $4,000 for displaced people in Afghanistan, especially in Kabul. And we were able to support four to five individuals in three provinces. And uh, the ways that you all can support this uh, kind of project is to, first of all, raise awareness about what's actually taking place, not only in Afghanistan, but you have to open your eyes and see what's uh, happening a few miles away from you. And today the problem with Afghanistan and the world is that just because Afghanistan is miles away from the US, from European countries, they tend to uh, put less focus on Afghanistan. And this is making it uh, worse for all of us because today Afghanistan is preparing to raise a generation of literacy and poverty, which is not going to only affect Afghan people in Afghanistan, but the whole, the entire world. So raising awareness is very important. And one way that you could always tie and take action by is social media, because on social media, we are all activists. Almost every day when I wake up, I try to share something that's important for other people to know. And one of those uh, campaigns that is, have been important for me and many other Afghan women these days is uh, advocating for Aliyah. She was arrested uh, about four months ago in Herat, Afghanistan, uh, because first of all, she's from a different ethnicity in Afghanistan, she's Hazara, which the Taliban do not like. And for no reason, she has been arrested. Her family does not know where she is. And what, one way that you could take action is to take a screenshot of this or make your own post and share it on your story on social media, on your Instagram most, more uh, importantly. And if uh, this is not something that you're comfortable with, then just add the name Afghanistan, Afghan woman, and tag your government officials. That's another way that you can take um, uh, action and draw attention to what's happening in Afghanistan right now. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And um, I think I talked more than that was needed. And now uh, I would like for you to play the video, which is a short video talking about Afghanistan and what's happening. Let's bring in Masi Ali Najad, Iranian journalist and activist, author of The Wind in My Hair, My Fight for Freedom in Modern Iran, and a nominee for this year's Nobel Peace Prize. Masi, welcome. Always good to have you with us. Thank you. So what is Thank your you so much reaction to what's happening in Herat and uh, the beheading of these mannequins? What's the meaning of this and what does it tell us about the bigger picture? 
Martha, to be honest, from the first time when I saw the video of the uh, shop owners behaving all the female mannequins, it just took me to my country, Iran. So we, people of Afghanistan and Iran, share the pain. We experience this. Uh, and I have to say that, yes, you see that uh, the mannequins are being beheaded, but in reality, in Afghanistan and Iran, under Sharia law, if you say that you don't want to be a Muslim anymore, if you criticize the prophets, if you criticize the Islamic uh, laws uh, in, for the crime of uh, apostasy and blasphemy, you will be beheaded in reality as well. So that actually breaks my heart, that people even don't realize that this is happening in 21st century. Right now, all those women in Afghanistan who had the chance to have part in police, government, the parliament, media, now they are all being pushed back behind the, behind the curtain again. But of course, women of Afghanistan are brave enough and taking to the street, protesting and saying that no one can keep us silent. But they are calling the rest of the world to hear their voices as well. Well, you have dedicated your life to making people aware of the oppression that happens in Iran and also pointing out what's happening in uh, Afghanistan under the Taliban. Um, John Andrasik, who is a musician with Five for Fighting, posted a video on YouTube against the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and the atrocities that have been left behind. It got pulled down from YouTube. They've now reinstated it. He did an interview with Dana Perino earlier today. And here's what he said, Masi. Sure. Is abandoning our allies our citizens a political message? No, it's a moral message. What about the greatest women's rights decimation in our history that we are complicit in? Lesbian and gays Afghans are being hunted and their partners beheaded in front of them. Children are being sold for food. So where are all these people who like to stand on their soapbox and preach to us about their moral compassion? Yeah, where are where are they in this country? Where are all the people who fight for freedoms for some of the groups that were just mentioned in this country? And why aren't they more outraged? Why don't we hear this every day from those same individuals about what's happening in your country and Afghanistan and other places? To be honest, it is very heartbreaking, and I always call it like um, this is a betrayal, not only uh, from Biden administration, it is a betrayal for all those politicians around the world who are witnessing that how people are being beheaded in Afghanistan, how people are getting shot in Iran, how people are suffering from not, you know, having basic freedom, but at the same time, like the whole world abandoning them. Martha. I uh, have, I'm in touch with a lot of women in Afghanistan, with a lot of people in Afghanistan. They're really angry with American government, and they cannot believe that overnight all their rights are being taken away from them, and now no one is talking about all the, those women, all those young girls being banned from going to school. Can you believe that? Yeah. In no. 21st century, and uh, people are only like, you know, um, just asking for their rights and they're being abandoned by the whole world. Yeah, where, where is the movement? Where is the Twitter? I remember bringing back our girls uh, when the Nigerian school girls were um, abducted. You know, it was, it was just this national kind of outcry, right? So where is that for what's going on? I think uh, some people don't want to look back at the situation in Afghanistan because it's, uh, it's not too Yeah, so Masih Ali Najat was talking about the fact that uh, Afghan women are very brave every day. You see them protesting for their rights in the heart of the Taliban, and you don't see any support from uh, international communities just by sharing their voices, just by telling what's, uh, what the Afghan women are doing. So don't forget that sharing stories, raising awareness could help a lot Afghan women, because right now they are being their soldiers and they're fighting empty handed. And if they don't receive support from international communities, from individuals like us, their message might not reach farther and it might affect us in the near future. And I'm gonna pass it to my best friend, Kara, uh, to share more about her work and her fight for human rights and women's rights. Are you there, Kara? Yeah, I'm here. Let's, oh, there we go. Hi. It's an honor to be here. Um, hello, everybody. And uh, it's an honor to uh, support 
Sonita's activism um, and the uh, rights of women and girls in Afghanistan. Um, women's advocacy work has been a passion of mine for about 15 years. I've designed and launched women and girls empowerment programs in both Brazil and the US. I also created a theater play called The Alchemy of Imperfection, which I bring to public venues and college campuses. The play uses poetry, world music, and dance to explore the questions. What happens when women speak and act truthfully? What are the consequences when we don't? And what is the cost of aiming for perfection? These performances are followed by public community conversations, exploring how men can support women to speak up and be seen, and how men can help women to be mobilized in our communities, in our politics, in the arts and sciences, as well as just having equal human rights, especially the rights to our own bodies. I believe that the future of all of us depends on the leadership of BIPOC women with an X. I saw Sunita's movie in Boulder, Colorado in 2015, just after coming back from Paris where I had written my first screenplay for a web series pilot concept of the alchemy of imperfection. And you can find the link in the chat uh, if you wanna learn more about that project. As I completed writing a scene, I discovered to my surprise that I had accidentally written what looked like a rap which was not something I had meant to. there it was a piece about women and all the ways we experience ourselves objectified in a world run and dominated by men regardless of cultural boundaries national identities or traditions Meanwhile, I had flown into Colorado to cast this new web series pilot, and it just so happened that when I arrived, I discovered that it was the week of the International Film Fest. I grabbed the schedule, and the one film that jumped out at me was the story of an Afghan refugee teenage rapper living in Iran, and I thought, okay, if this girl is gutsy enough to be a rapper, maybe I can learn something from her and find the courage to do something with this new poem I wrote. So an hour later, I was sitting in a theater watching Sonita's film. I was so incredibly moved by Sonita's story, particularly by her vision and her ability to see her future differently and to believe in her dreams despite her very foreboding circumstances. Sonita is someone who uh, I'm sure you can tell if you have seen her movie at a very young age against all odds envisioned a world in which she could be more fully expressive, passionate and free as both a woman and an artist. But Sonita's vision doesn't stop there. She extends beyond her own ambitions and dedicates every ounce of her energy, her fierce talent and her heart to raise up and bring more opportunities to women and girls everywhere. Fast forward to two years later, I discovered from a mutual friend that Sonita had just enrolled into Bard College near my hometown of Woodstock, New York, and we were introduced. The day I met Sonita, we went to lunch, then traded rap songs. She wrapped me a piece she had re recently written called Bad Girls, and I read her a piece I had recently written. When I finished, she looked at me and said, can I wrap that? And I said, hell yeah. From that day on, Sonita and I became like family and she and I began to collaborate on activism and creative projects. I learned increasingly more about the work that she continues to do as an advocate for women and girls and uh, as well as the impossible position her activism puts her in re with regard to her family's safety. Because Sonita is so outspoken against the Taliban and child marriage, her family has been in extreme danger in Afghanistan ever since the US evacuated the country and left it to Taliban rule. 
So it's been my goal to support Sonita and her family in whatever ways I can to further her vision and purpose and to help them get to safety. So I started out by introducing her to filmmakers and recording engineers in my network to help her develop her music videos. Then she began sending me rap lyrics and songs as well as legislative letters for protests which I edit for her whenever needed. It's so important that we all find ways to make a difference in the lives of the women and girls who have been robbed of their families, their education, their work in the world, in many cases, their own bodies and their futures. Each of us can do something and that something can change lives. Most recently, I started a GoFundMe campaign to raise funds for Sonita's family uh, for her six family members to emigrate to either the US or Canada, where they can find permanent safety from the Taliban and start a new life. A lot of funds are needed for the legal fees, visas, passports, airfare, and basic survival needs. So I hope you will contribute. And you can find that link in the chat, as well as on Sunita's website, on her Instagram page bio, and uh, my Instagram page bio. All contributions will go directly to Sonita's family. Um, and your support really, truly helps. I'll share with you uh, the original rap song that I wrote for the Alchemy of Imperfection that led to uh, my meeting Sonita and our many collaborations since. So I'm gonna share this on my screen and you can read along. I've been a trophy and I have felt like trash. I've been a prayer and a piece of ass. I've been the future and I've been a face. I've been enhanced and I've been erased. I've been erased. I've been a cougar and I've been a catch. I've been the fire and the match desired detested, refused, requested, pillaged, protected, required, rejected. I have been the beauty and I have been the beast. I have been repressed and I have been released. I have caused the famine and I have been the feast. I've been worshiped and I've been warred upon. You want to hear more? I could go on and on. I have been needed and neglected, blessed and bested, silenced and suggestive, manicured and molested. I have been abused and I have been adored. I've been impassioned and ignored. I've been prized and I've been played. I've been predator and I've been prey. I've been a fugitive and a fantasy. I've been psycho and I've been sanity. I've been pious and profane. I've been the vessel. I've been the vein. I've been cheated and I've been chased, designated and displaced, informed and ill-advised. I've been valued and victimized. I've been the temptress and the tart. I've been the artist and I've been the art. I've been honored and I've been oppressed. I've been unwanted and I've been undressed. I've been released and I've been repressed. I've been supported and second guessed. I've been a mother and a martyr. I've been the bounty and the barter, abandoned, approached, rewarded, reproached. I've been a girlfriend and I've been a ghost. I've been foraged and forgotten, dazzled and disheartened. I've been the melody and I've been the muse. I've been unified and I've been used. I've been glorified and I've been ghosted. I've been relished and I've been roasted. I've been safety and I've been sin. I've been fat and I've been thin. I've been a healer and a whore. I've been a blessing and a bore. I've been strong and I've been soft. I've been coddled and I've been cut off. I've been smitten and I've been smited. I've been induced and indicted. 
I've been sanctified and I've been sold. I've been ogled and I've been old. I've been blurred and I've been bold. I've been bold. I've been the bloom and I've been the bud. I've been the brine and the blood. I've been the booty and the bride. I've been the buyer and the bribe. I've been replenished and I've been raped. I've been shaved and I've been shaped. I've been hailed and hated, molded and mutilated. I've brought the rage and I've been the refugee. I've been the greed and the giving tree. I've been the babe and I've been the bitch. I've been the weakling and the witch. I've been cherished and I've been chastised. I've been burned and I've been baptized. So just to wrap up, um, if you want to learn more about my work, you can go to my website. Again, that's the alchemy of perfection.com or check visionaries or follow me at Kara Crookshank on Instagram or Facebook. Whenever I have some funds that I can contribute, I ask Sonita to recommend the most trustworthy organizations to donate to to support Afghan women and girls. So here are a few that I would like to share with you. Um, the first, I, unfortunately, I don't have visuals for these, but I can drop uh, the, the names and descriptions in the chat. So I'll do that now. Uh, bear with me for one quick moment. Here we go. OK, so we've got food packages, Kabul, uh, as well as azeal.xyz, where you can donate toward emergency meals or an emergency first aid package uh, to an Afghan family. Too young to wed.org, where you can donate toward critically needed food and or heating materials and help keep families from having to sell their daughters in exchange for basic necessities. And finally, there's also a, a website, Girls Not Briots, which has a similar mission. It's so important to get involved and to support these women and girls who have been abandoned by foreign aid and protection. They are marching in the streets. They are risking their lives. They are risking their families' lives, um, but they have nothing left to lose. So all they have left is their own courage and conviction for a different life. Um, so please do what you can. And thank you so much. All right, thank you so much to both Sonita and Kara. So now I'd like to invite the audience to, if you have any questions, please type out, to at least take a minute to type out your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, and we will take them one by one. We have one question so far. Um, and Sonita, would you mind turning your video back on? Okay. Kara, thanks. Uh, okay, so we have a question from an audience member. Um, in the documentary, we see you begin school in the United States. How was the transition for you, and were you able to finish school here? Um, it was the first week was actually really hard for me because of English, because of not having any friends there. Um, I struggled a lot, but fortunately, my roommates was very talkative. She helped me a lot to learn English faster. And classes, one of them or two of them, I failed, obviously, because it was the beginning for me. And that was my first time being in a real school. So I, whatever I, I was learning, it was all new to me. And I struggled a lot, but um, I graduated, mm -hmm. obviously. <laughs> Uh, 2018 and I went to American University for a year uh, which I didn't like a lot and then I came to Bard College and today I'm doing a joint major in human rights and music. Well, congratulations on finishing yeah. school here and then also getting started at Bard. 
um but let's see we have a question on your music um how has well actually it's two questions on your music so i'll combine them so how has your career as a rapper been are you still writing music i know kara talked a little bit about that too um your collaboration and then also is there anybody you would like to work with in the future another musician that you'd like to write with or perform with um music career has been difficult here in the u.s because first of all i'm a student on an f1 visa and whatever i try to do costs so much money and i don't really have the ability to sponsor myself right now uh, whatever you hear on social media you see on youtube i um created the beat, I did the mixing and mastering, and sometimes I got help from friends. And uh, for example, with editing, uh, I get help from Kara. Uh, it's not easy to work in the US and also to write rap songs in English, uh, but uh, I have to start using whatever I have available to me. And one of the artists that I really wish to work with is Rihanna. Uh -huh. uh, as you saw, Rihanna was my <laughs> dream mother in the uh, documentary. And also, I really hope to be able to work with Bono in the near future, uh, because he's also very passionate uh, about women's rights. Um, and a few songs that I have, I have written in English. I'm waiting for a good moment for a, an opportunity to share with some of these artists to see if they would like to uh, collaborate. Mm -hmm. I actually have a related question. Um, have you ever been have you ever been able to get in touch with Eminem and tell him how his work inspired you <laughs> in a gym in Tehran? Um, I haven't. I know a few people who uh, promised me uh -huh. that they would give my message to him, but I never heard back from them. Um, it's hard to get in touch with them, but I'm hoping maybe when I'm able to have a hit or have a song that could reach out to him through that, I would be able to introduce my work to him and the role that he had in my music. I hope so too. Um, let's see, we have a question from Angela Osborne. Um, is your family now more supportive of the choices that you've made for yourself? Um, they are very supportive. And in my music video, which you can find it on YouTube, um, it's called Run Boy. My mom decided to appear in my music video and she was the one who was against me rapping and having her in a music video. It's life changing, not only for me, but for so many other families and friends that I have. And because of their support today, they're at a great risk. They were, and fortunately they're in a safer place today. And because of my uh, other project that I talked about, Arazu. Uh, unfortunately, one of the kids that we supported, it turned out to be um, a Talib's girl, daughter, uh, father. So we supported this little girl and when the Taliban took over, she was our neighbor and his, uh, her father took weapon and then joined the uh, Taliban. And they also knew about me and my family and the project that we were running to support children. Uh, so they targeted my family when my family was hiding in a place. Uh, they went to our house uh, searching for my family. They were at a great risk and because of me, because of uh, my work and the support of my work. And today um, they are, I can tell you they're my fans and always very supportive. And uh, another thing that I like to share with you is that as you, some of you know, my mom uh, never knew how to write or read but today she is learning how to read and write in English, which I thought it was life-changing for me. And yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a related question from Sarah Shannon um, on if you, have, if you know whether women in Afghanistan, what do they think about your music? 
and have they been inspired to maybe create their own music and so on although i know it's very difficult now um i just released another old uh, song which is kind of mixed with an old song a new one and i shared it the messages that i received is all inspiring to me myself knowing that through music i can uh, give these girls, women in Afghanistan, more hope and reason why they should not stop. And so far, uh, the messages that I've received from each of them, not only from uh, Afghan women, from women around the world, whoever has an interest in my music and my message. And most of the time, they remind me of the importance of my message, talking about um, giving girls the same opportunities that you give boys and just see what a, a positive change they will make in not only in their lives but also in other people's lives around them mm -hmm. so it is positive but obviously some men they're against what i'm talking about especially when i talk about child marriage they um, do not like it and they think it's a part of their religion or tradition that should be repeated over and over even though it's violating the rights of little girls. Mm -hmm. That reminds me that one of the dominant images that we continue to see in US media in the uh, following the current Taliban takeover of Afghanistan is this is constant articles and images of young children being sold by their parents. Um, not even um, not even like say adolescent girls, but very, very, very young children, like four year olds and so on. Do you feel like that is representative, those images, those stories? Is it representative of how it actually what is actually happening? Um, I don't think that's everything that you hear because there is more happening, um, like what people are going through. Um, the recent message that I got from a friend is that um, a girl was shot just because of speaking up in Afghanistan and uh, no one knows about this event that happened and children are being sold exchanged with food. Uh, mostly uh, Afghan people know about this because social media, some of the foreign news medias, they intend to cut those sad images, sad stories, and they think this is already repeated and they don't want to repeat themselves. While it is very important to talk about the current situation, which is this is happening kind of every day in Afghanistan. People don't have food to eat. People don't have a place to shelter. And with the earthquake that we had in Afghanistan recently and with the flood, we experience more people like uh, being forced into selling whatever they have to keep the rest of the families alive. And since the Afghanistan people have been uh, targeted by the Taliban and the Taliban prevent them from uh, reaching um, to have access to education, because edu when you have education, you know more about your rights and you, know, you have more possibilities how to uh, solve your problems. And people right now, they're just locked down and they just think about what they have, whatever they have to sell. And since being they're being taught by the Taliban that women are being used as objects, something that is available, something that you can sell, exchange. So this is what they have right now. They keep changing their girls, keep selling their girls, whatever they have. And Kara was telling you about the food packages and about the NGOs. Those NGOs are doing a great job in terms of uh, saving um, as many lives as they can. And if you could donate or if you could just send the links to other people, it could prevent another girl from being sold or exchanged with food. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a question for Kara. What led you to the creative and activist work you've been doing now? And then as young activists, university activists and so on, how can people follow in your footsteps? Um, I think being female in the world and um, just a thirst for truth and knowledge was what probably sparked my interest in activism and social justice. Um, my 
some part of my origin comes from Brazil uh, and I've spent extended time in northern Brazil, which is primarily Afro culture um, and had a pretty good dose of what the situation is for girls and teenagers and women um, in that country uh, across socioeconomic tiers and divides. Um, and that's really where I woke up to um, the need for activism, particularly focused on female population, um, just the lack of emphasis on education, the lack of um, governance of our own bodies, and, uh, you know, some call Brazilian culture the invisible burqa. Um, mythologically, it's supposed to be a very uh, sexually liberated culture, but there's a very dark side to that uh, for women and, and girls as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what sparked it. Uh, and then um, how to follow in my footsteps, I, I would just say, read good books, listen to good podcasts, get inspired by whatever means necessary and, and see where that leads you um, in terms of what you feel most passionate about doing and, and um, where to put your creative energy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and I want to encourage people to continue to ask questions in the chat. I'm sorry, in the Q&A, we have time. Um, next question is from Mikael Nielsen. Uh, hi, Sanita. How do you manage to do both your art, activism, youth life, and school? The day only has 24 hours. <laughs> Uh, hi, Miko. He's one of my good friends. <laughs> um, honestly, I don't know how, but um, I prioritize like what is important to me. And uh, I try to invest most of my time on doing that. Uh, for example, advocating for Afghan women these days. Um, for past a few months, I've been just uh, working on that. And of course I have to find some fun to, otherwise I would not be able to continue. And to do that, I usually uh, write music because uh, music is fun for me uh, whenever it's not about like sad topics, but making beats is uh, fun for me. And also watching videos, movies and exercising, um, but Right now I'm on a break, uh, which gives me more time. So I have a schedule, which in the morning I do a few minutes of like um, writing, um, just writing like what I'm gonna do today. And then I have two or three hours doing advocacy work and then writing my life story, which is another important project that I have. And then um, doing something fun, like cooking, watching something. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it sounds very, very efficient, like more than <laughs> I know I can manage right now. Uh, let's see, we have a question from Ahmad Sakanyar, um, and also there's uh, another name attached to this, Jawad. Thank you for the talk, Sunita. You spoke bravely and honestly. What are your academic goals besides rap music? And what are you, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're studying now? Right now, um, uh studying a lot of things related to human rights and music, my major. And my goal is to stay in college as long as I can, first of all, because I cannot return to Afghanistan right now. I'm on an F1 visa, which is scarier for me, so I need to be in a school. Uh, but my longer uh, goal, uh, ultimate goal is to stay at bar doing my master, uh, degree and then maybe PhD. I'm not sure, but uh, because BARD provides so much support for me and the place is the right uh, space for me to be. So mm -hmm. that would be my goal to just stay there, learn as much as I can. Uh, also, BARD College is very supportive of humanitarian uh, projects. Uh, it would be the best place for me to stay there. Mm -hmm. We, I, we just have a quick comment from Dr. Frida Ikoto, who is a professor of Afro-American studies and um, comparative literature here at the University of Michigan. She's also a filmmaker. 
Um, and so she just wanted you to know, um, hi, Sunita, I'm very impressed by your work and please know that you are not alone. Thank you, keep going. Thank you for your work. Thank you, that means a lot. Uh, let's see, all right. Um, next question is for Sunita. Um, uh, audience member wants to know, how is your friend, the one that was the young woman who was married in the documentary? Are you still in touch? And then what about the woman who ran the program you were in? Um, she was the one I was talking about, Farzana, who was engaged with a man, 35 years old. And after me leaving uh, Iran and then Afghanistan, escaping child marriage, she also found her voice or the reason that she had to speak up. And she got divorced. Today, she's in college and becoming an actress. The woman, Khanum Ms. Puri, the head of uh, the NGO, unfortunately, because of me, I was mm -hmm. a musician, still is. In Iran, it's a crime because uh, no one can, the female cannot sing solo or rap against the government's beliefs. So um, when I was at the NGO, uh, they realized that in the NGO, there was a rapper and they heard one of my songs, which was about, against the uh, Iranian government mistreating Afghan refugees. So they came and she was at risk. And after a while, she had to leave and close the NGO, but they were able to open it again. And uh, she decided not to teach anymore or to be at the NGO because of different reasons and also what happened uh, to me and her and the uh, struggle and problems that we had between the government and the NGO. So today she's at a different school teaching um, children Farsi. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question. Uh, what was it like watching this documentary about yourself? <laughs> Maybe you have seen quite a few times. Is there anything that happened that you wish was included but wasn't, or anything that was included that you did not want to be in it? Uh, the first time I saw it, it was in 2015, I believe, in Norway. And mm -hmm. I wasn't sure what I was going to watch. And I it did actually surprise me. Uh, and it made me cry so much when it was the time to say goodbye to my uh, niece, Fadia, in the documentary. Because uh, that was very touching to me and I could not get over it because I was missing family, I was missing her, I was missing home. And uh, it did hurt me that part, but I'm glad it was there because um, other people have to see it. Like it wasn't easy for me to leave home and it wasn't easy for my family to be on their own. Um, and especially my niece. Um, today, my niece is still in uh, Iran. She got engaged a few years ago at age 15. Um, and then I had a conversation with the family. Fortunately, she got divorced too. And she's in school and planning to find a way for her to uh, go to another country to, st to continue her study. And there are there are different parts that I wish they were there, but obviously it could not be that long. The documentary, for example, I wanted to include the parts that we went to um, a theater in Kabul, Afghanistan. And right after leaving, there was an explosion, which was terrifying to see people, to see the chaos. Uh, we did not add that and instead we added the news um, so that was one part, I believe. Thank you. Um, you know, actually, that reminds me that um, there was a question that came up when I watched the documentary with my students regarding the way that the film, the, the relationship between you and the filmmaker, um, because it was she, she, although she is the filmmaker, it was very interesting to see her participate directly into your life in your life um, and for example um, particip participate financially in your life um, 
which is not necessarily something that, you know, that will happen necessarily between filmmakers and their subjects. Um, what, what, what happened there, you know, like when she, you know, she essentially gave your mother money um, so that you could stay in, in Iran and not have to go back to Afghanistan. And then do you have a relationship with the filmmaker now? Um, so many people actually ask her how she feels about the fact that she interrupted or she paid money to my mom. And I usually don't understand because if you can support, if you can give help, why shouldn't you? Um, it's not like she's she wasn't trying to uh, change my life entirely. She was just helping me to buy some time. And that time gave me more uh, flexibility to actually work on a project that I had. And that project led to a bigger project to come here in the US. Not only, I didn't do it by myself, obviously. It was with the help of many other individuals and herself. But I had the desire, I had the possibilities. I had the, um, I worked hard for it. And I think she did the right thing um, because I really needed her support, anyone's help that could convince my mom to give me some time. And she made the right decision. And um, when my mom left, I had the time uh, to write more music, which one of the songs that I wrote, I participated in a uh, competition and I won 1000 and send it to back to my family. And that helped me even more. So if any of you here, you guys are the uh, directors, filmmakers, uh, please don't hesitate to interfere with your protagonist's <laughs> life so be, when they need it. Um, it shouldn't be always like what others do or how it should be just, uh, just imagine what they need and what could help your protagonist's life more to um, help her achieve her goal. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that take. Um, do you still have a relationship with the filmmaker now? I do. So it's not, um, we don't talk like every day or a lot, but we are still friends. I'm still in touch with her. Uh, she's in Germany working on different projects and one of her recent uh, project is actually about um, a guy from Afghanistan trying to escape. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a question that is for both Kara and Sunita. Um, so we can, you know, take turns on this. Um, for Sunita, what is the hardest part of being a woman rapper? And then same for Kara, what's the hardest part of being an artist and a poet? A woman artist and poet. Okay, you want me to go, Kara? Yeah. Uh, yeah, kick it off. <laughs> <laughs> Living in Iran, it was really difficult. Like whenever I went to record a song, and I would have my notebook in my backpack. I always felt like I was carrying drugs because it's so dangerous. It would uh, make you feel like you're a criminal. Uh, so be being a rapper, being a musician in Iran, uh, it was very difficult because basically you put your life at risk for something that you want to achieve or record even one song. Mm -hmm. And that was risky and today I, um, me being here, I think whenever I make new pieces and I distribute it with others, it, it does help me to spread my message farther. But um, the people who are close to me, the people that I love, the people that are in Afghanistan, in Iran, I put them at risk. So it's not easy for me to just speak up. It has consequences. But I also cannot stay silent while all these crises happening in Afghanistan. Thank you. Um, let's see, we might have time for one more question. Um, how has your family been in Afghanistan after the most recent events? And then what's it like there now? Oh, and uh, I'm sorry, Kara. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, did you want me to follow that question? Um, I think the, I mean, obviously, as Sunita just pointed out, it, it depends on what country and culture you're uh, expressing your art within. Um, but, uh, you know, here in the US and Brazil and, and Europe, where I spend the majority of time, uh, those three places, I would say the, the honest answer is, um, can you know commitment fortitude uh courage conviction because you know the arts and um and certainly poetry uh but but all aspects of the arts are have been historically male dominated for as long as <laughs> since the renaissance um and uh so you know it's not a linear process to have a career in the arts uh, especially as an independent artist when you're really creating your own work and putting it into the world um, there's lots of ups and downs um, i think the important thing is having a network of support uh, of people who who can kind of be there when when you start to lose confidence in the work that you're doing um, and and i also encourage anyone who's thinking they might be an artist to to claim that um, because uh, that's part of the revolution, I think, of, of decolonizing the arts is for women and people of color to, to claim themselves uh, with the title and, and put what they have to share in the world, so. Um, thanks both of you for that. Uh, let's see, we have like two final questions. One of them, um, as I said, is how has Sunita, how has your family been in Afghanistan after the most recent events? We already heard a little bit about that, um, but if you want to elaborate, and then what is it like for them there now? My family, fortunately, they were able to escape Afghanistan. They're in a third country right now. And I'm trying to uh, help them to come to the US or Canada. And right now, I'm not there to tell you exactly how it is, but what I hear from others and what I see on social media, it's basically sometimes like a ghost town. Uh, people are scared to go out. People are scared to even go shopping. Um, and most importantly, to speak up for their rights. And right now the Taliban are working towards a country without women. And it, this is, I don't know why this does not scare the rest of the world because they're trying everything, like asking the, the, the Pakistani government, asking whoever supports them, the, the Iranian government to provide them uh, with whatever their needs is, like financial support to suppress those countries that ask the Taliban to invest in women's rights because they have no interest in listening to the countries that are in favor of human rights. And I think um, today Afghanistan is, um, some people tell me that it's even worse than 1996 because you even without a reason, they come in and take you away without telling you this was happening in 1996 too, but they wouldn't right away come inside your house and take you away and kill you in front of your family. Um, these are very uh, scary um, things that I, videos and news that I hear from others. And I'm not there to tell you exactly how it is, but the news is very shocking. And uh, it asks everyone every one of us to talk about Afghanistan, to keep the conversation going on, especially when it's uh, related to women's rights, because yesterday they banned them from working, uh, another day they banned them from going to work, and uh, recently they banned female mannequins in, in the store. So imagine what's going to happen next. Yeah, a country without women is a really shocking way to frame it. Um, but, you know, uh, appropriate. 
The last question is, um, how can we support young Afghan artists who are starting their musical careers? And what is something that we could be doing now that would have helped you at that time? Good question. Um, if you like to support Afghan artists, which there are so many of them right now left behind in Afghanistan, for example, one of my friends, He's a rapper. Uh, he left Afghanistan to Iran and recently he was uh, deported back to Afghanistan, no matter how scary for him he, it is. And uh, he's uh, well known in Afghanistan. He has been uh, vocalized about whatever is happening in Afghanistan. And he has written a few songs against the Taliban. And that puts him at a very riskier situation, but still he has no support from anyone, any NGOs. And if you like to support, uh, I, I have a few NGOs, one of them called um, Artists Rescue, which you could uh, sign a petition, which you could pick one of the Afghan artists and talk about them and why they need to be evacuated immediately. So that's one way you can uh, support them. And the artists that are already here, it's great. They don't need to right away make music as long as they're safe, they're alive. So we need to put our focus on people that are left behind in Afghanistan because they have no one to take care of them. They have no one to uh, care for them. So if you wanna invest time, energy and support, it, I encourage you, to take care of an artist who's left behind in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And the way that you could help me, it would be uh, following my work on social media and share the news that we share, because again, uh, raising awareness is the key. Because if you ask people to support you with a project that you have to promote human rights, promote a cause that you care about, if they don't know enough about that, um, uh, cause that you're promoting or that you care about. So they might not be able to help you. I just want you to raise awareness. And that's all I'm asking you today. And if you can share the link, uh, go find me with your friends if they're able to support my family as well. Okay, so that's all the time that we have now. Thank you so much for joining us today to the audience. And thank you so much to our speakers, Sunita Alisada and Kara Krikshank. So as a reminder, if you want to hear about similar events from us, Global Islamic Studies, including our Afghanistan speakers film, please sign up for our newsletter. And thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs>